Hi everyone, I'm Joe Rogers, President and CEO of the Texas Heart Institute, and I'd like to thank you for the kind invitation to speak at the Women's Symposium this year. My topic is to discuss with you the diagnosis and management of heart failure in women. I think this cartoon highlights one of the real challenges that we have in medicine, and that is an appreciation for the fact that men and women do respond differently to uh, a variety of different conditions. Uh, you know, throughout the entire spectrum of healthcare, and we need to be mindful of those, we need to study them, and I'll talk a little bit more about that as my uh, comments move forward. So I'll start this way and just ask you if these two heart failure patients are the same. On the left side of the slide is a 60-year-old uh, gentleman who has a long-standing history of heart failure, comes to the office with three weeks of worsening symptoms, and is hypotensive, and a cartoon of what his ventricle might look like in cross-section, an echo image showing a markedly enlarged left ventricle, which is certainly dysfunctional, and a chest x-ray that despite having symptoms of heart failure doesn't show a lot of pulmonary edema. And contrasted on the right side of the slide to a very typical female presentation of, of heart failure, an 80-year-old woman with a long-standing history of hypertension who gets breathless suddenly presents to the emergency room with a blood pressure of 185 over 120, and her cardiac anatomy and her physiology is very different, right? It's a very thickened uh, ventricle. Oftentimes, the left ventricular cavity is small, and oftentimes on chest x-ray, there's marked pulmonary edema. And despite the fact that both of these patients carry a diagnosis of heart failure, the pathobiology of this is very different. So we'd like to explore that a little bit more in the context of this talk. To briefly remind you of the incidence of heart failure uh, from individuals in their early 20s through uh, their older age, you'll see in this slide that up until the age of about 80, the incidence of heart failure is about one and a half times the, uh, that of, um, of uh, women in men. Uh, but once uh, people get to the age of about 80, it flips and the incidence of heart failure increases uh, in women to that be greater than that uh, of the incidence of heart failure in men. With regards to hospitalizations, this is some data from the AHA statistical um, uh, summary that's put out each year. You can see that there's been a narrowing of heart failure hospitalizations between men and women, although in the late 1990s and the early 2000s, the hospitalization rate for women was higher uh, uh, in, uh, in women than in men, but it's become more equal now. And if you look at mortality, you can appreciate the fact in the top couple of lines in the slide that the mortality rate for incident heart failure in women is lower than in men. And in this uh, really interesting cohort, the Southern Community Cohort Study, which was a uh, 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 a population of, a largely a population of women, uh, a great preponderance of African Americans tended to be low income. Uh, but you can see in this, in, in this analysis that the, the white women and black women in this cohort study have about a similar uh, uh, survival rate uh, over eight years. So, so there are some important differences uh, between men and women who have heart failure, and we'll explore this a little bit further as the talk goes on. So I think that this slide helps summarize some of these important differences between men and women who have a diagnosis of heart failure. If you look over on the left, that compared to men, women with heart failure are much more likely to be older. They're much more likely to have heart failure with preserved ejection fraction and have antecedent hypertension, diabetes, obesity, and oftentimes have more kidney dysfunction, and atrial fibrillation, which as you know, uh, is a common, uh, I mean, is, is a common concomitant um, illness in heart failure. And in the cartoons on the right, I think that this frames up uh, this difference in a really interesting way. You can see that there are some important differences in drivers of heart failure. There are obviously some important um, gender-specific uh, issues, including the treatment for breast cancer, which is predominantly a female disease, and of course there are peripartum cardiomyopathies. The remodeling that women get in response to cardiac injury is different than it is in men, but I really like this idea that, that heart failure in women is predominantly sort of an endothelial inflammation microvascular disease as opposed to men which is predominantly a macrovascular disease that's characterized by myocyte necrosis and scar formation. 
And that leads to very different kinds of phenotypes. Women, as we've already mentioned, tend to have more hef-pef. They're more predisposed, it seems, to Takasubo cardiomyopathy and obviously to peripartum cardiomyopathy. And I'll show you a little bit of data coming up just to demonstrate that, um, that the prognosis in women, uh, they tend to have a better survival, but they have more symptoms and a worse quality of life than men. And here's some of that data. This was some data published a couple of years ago in the Journal uh, of the American College of Cardiology, uh, just looking at, at, at outcomes, but also at, at uh, clinical symptoms and, at also, and, um, and quality of life. At the top of this graph on the left, you can see the KCC, KCCQ clinical summary scores, women in blue, men in red, with lower numbers representing a lower quality of life. You can see that women with HEF-REF tended to have a lower quality of life score than men who had heart failure. Below that, the clinical features, women tended to have more symptoms, more breathlessness, both with exertion and at rest, more edema, and more of the physical findings of heart failure than men. But it's interesting and somewhat ironic that they have better longer-term outcomes. So if you look at a composite outcome of mortality and hospitalizations, their mortality rate was lower. Their rate of first hospitalizations for heart failure is lower cardiovascular death and all-cause mortality is lower. And I think, again, driving to this, this fundamental concept that the pathobiology of heart failure in men and women is different, and we shouldn't be treating them the same way. We should be thinking about the particular drivers of heart failure in women and thinking a little bit about whether or not there are important differences in the therapies that we select. And I hope I can convince you by the end of this talk uh, that, that maybe we should be thinking um, a little bit differently about some of the treatments. I'd like to turn our attention though, before we get to the treatment of heart failure, to how we might think about preventing heart failure in women, because ultimately we'd like to prevent um, heart failure in both men and women. And this is an example of some of the comorbidities associated with heart failure in both men and women from a paper that was published in Jack Heart Failure a couple of years ago. And I think what you can appreciate is that in particular, the prevalence of antecedent hypertension um, is an important driver of heart failure in women. And this should be a target for our therapies to, as a preventative measure uh, in, this, uh, in half of the population. And it, it's in contradistinction to some of the other drivers of heart failure that we know of in men, including coronary disease and particularly smoking. And I thought this was a very interesting paper that really looked at and described the additive impact of risk factors for the development, in heart uh, development of heart failure in women. This is from the Women's Health Initiative. And on the right side of the slide, you can see um, the incredible impact on incident heart failure by adding more than one of the risk factors on the left to the development of symptomatic heart failure in all comers and then broken out by race, African-American, white, and Hispanic. But I think an important observation that these risk factors provide additive risk for women to develop ventricular dysfunction and symptomatic heart failure. So again, in a stylized kind of way, if we're going to think about how to prevent heart failure in women, there should be some different kinds of targets. On the left side of the slide, uh, targets and strategies to prevent heart failure in women with reduced ejection fraction. So heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. And on the left side of the slide, many of the risk factors for ischemic disease, as we know, hypertension, um, uh, hyperlipidemia, smoking, et cetera. Uh, but on the right side of the slide, uh, uh, some really nuanced and interesting ways to think about this. Uh, you know, obviously in women, we should be thinking about some of the, uh, the breast cancer therapies as drivers of non-ischemic cardiomyopathy. The interesting and complex uh, pregnancy-related issues uh, that can impact women's heart health. Stress cardiomyopathy, or Takasubo, as I've already mentioned, and then diabetes and microvascular disease um, being important considerations and targets for us and, and medical issues on which we should pay attention to de the development of non-ischemic cardiomyopathies in HEF-REF. And on the right side of this slide, I, as, a, as a sort of a, an, a, a stylized approach to thinking about heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, 
And as I was looking at this figure, it really was um, striking to me that much of this can be tied together in the context of metabolic syndrome. It's, it's truncal obesity associated with hypertension and with, um, and with diabetes or insulin resistance that results in an inflammatory condition and causes endothelial cell dysfunction. So I, I, I tend to think that there's, there's a connection here that we've not entirely made, but we should be thinking about controlling these risk factors as best we can to prevent um, heart failure with preserved ejection fraction in women. And I think maybe an underappreciated issue that we should all be aware of is that, and this has been shown in multiple studies, is that there is a difference in how men and women tolerate drugs or at least report um, adverse events. So first of all, we're all very aware that women are underrepresented in clinical trials uh, universally, but particularly in cardiovascular disease and particularly in heart failure. And as a result of that, we know less about the adverse events and adverse drug uh, reactions in women. But women seem to be a bit more susceptible to um, adverse drug reactions. And it leads to a difference in adherence to some of the drug therapy that we prescribe. And we should be mindful and cognizant of those differences. So I, I suspect that some of you that uh, are listening to this today have a very clear recollection of the DIGE trial. The DIGE trial was a prospective trial to assess the impact of digoxin uh, in patients who have HEF-REF. And you, you'll remember that there was no difference in a primary outcome of mortality and heart failure hospitalization, but an early sub-analysis um, of that study suggested that women who um, were treated with placebo in that study had a better survival rate than the women who were treated with digoxin. And so it gave us an early signal that in fact there are different gender-related differences in how people respond to drug therapy. And in a subsequent analysis that was published a couple of years later, the explanation for this may have come out and that is women tended to have higher digoxin levels um, than men did. And that may have been part of the driver for the effect that we saw on mortality uh, in the DIGE trial. So what I've shown you in this slide is the most recent recommendations for the treatment of heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. And what I've included on here are the, what we know about the outcomes uh, related to survival on, um, uh, between men and women. And I want to be clear that what I'm showing you here when the arrow says it goes up, it shows that there's an improvement in survival. Uh, when it goes down, it's worse, but there are none of those. And then if it's a horizontal arrow, it has no known impact. So, uh, for example, in the first uh, step in the management of heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, it's recommended that we use an ARNI, an ACE inhibitor, or an ARB, but really an ARNI would be preferred uh, based upon the clinical trials demonstrating that uh, Secubitril Valsartan is superior to ACE inhibitors tagged to an evidence-based beta blocker and a flexible diuretic regimen. And the data that we have suggests that ACE inhibitors do improve survival in men, ARBs improve survival in men. There weren't enough women in those trials to really make a definitive statement. A retrospective analysis of the trials of Succubitril Valsartan suggests that both men and women derive advantage from that, as same with beta blockers. It seems that both men and women derive similar kinds of benefits from beta blockade. So that's the foundational element of our heart failure with reduced ejection fraction pharmacotherapy. And then we tailor it even a bit further down at the bottom of this slide. In individuals who have preserved renal function and a normal serum potassium, the addition of an MRA would be um, a reasonable thought. That's been shown to improve survival in both men and women. Um, there's some really compelling evidence which we'll review shortly to suggest that individuals who have reasonable kidney function uh, will derive a survival advantage with an SGLT2 inhibitor, and that seems to have a fairly profound effect in both men and women. A flexible diuretic regimen, as you know, diuretics have not been shown to have either a positive or negative impact on survival, but important for symptom control. Hydrolyzine and nitrates in, in 
patients already on guideline-directed medical therapy who are African-American seems to be a survival advantage to both men and women by adding a fixed combination of hydrolysine and nitrates. And finally, a drug that we don't use a lot in the United States or frankly in Europe is evabradine, but it has been demonstrated in people who have a persistent heart rate of over 70 on guideline-directed medical therapy to improve survival. But it's beginning to become very confusing about how to start and titrate these drugs. And the traditional way we've taught people to do this over the years is shown on the left side of the slide where you start with either an ACE inhibitor or an ARB and then you add a beta blocker and then you add an MRA and then maybe you switch to an RNA and then you might add an SGLT2 inhibitor and you kind of go on and on through multiple steps which oftentimes takes years to get patients on a guideline directed approach to medical therapy. But on the right side of this slide, Milton Packer and John McMurray proposed a different kind of approach, this rapid sequencing approach where you start a beta blocker and an SGLT2 inhibitor and then very promptly add an ARNI and then shortly after that add a mineralocorticoid receptor antagonist and then begin to titrate the doses over the subsequent several months. And I think that this kind of approach provides a little different and more contemporary framework that we should use to consider how to begin therapy for HEF-REF. Here are some of the data looking at the SGLT2 inhibitors. You know, this is a very interesting class of drugs that was originally uh, tested in diabetics and a subgroup analysis demonstrated an improvement in heart failure in every subsequent trial in diabetics and now trials in heart failure patients without diabetes have demonstrated improvements in heart failure hospitalization and mortality. A meta-analysis of the, of the diabetes trials shown on the top right demonstrating um, that the drug, uh, the outcomes favor treatment with the drug. And then from the Empereg trial shown here at the bottom in the middle, demonstrating important 25% um, relative risk reductions in the population of patients randomized to a pagliflozin relative to placebo who had HEF-REF. But a lot of women, as we talked about, have HEF-PEF. So what do we know about the management of HEF-PEF uh, in this patient population? And these are the guidelines that were released in 2013. And the high-level recommendations, the level one recommendations were for blood pressure control and the use of, di uh, of diuretics to control volume overload. Everything else below that was a lower level recommendation. We just didn't have a good database for any kind of pharmacologic approach. But I want to try to convince you that there are a couple of drugs that you should be thinking about using in HEFPEF. And, and of course, then it applies to the use of these drugs in women who are more likely to have this condition. The first is the TOPCAT trial. You'll remember the TOPCAT trial was a HEF, um, REF study, I'm sorry, HEFPEF study comparing spironolactone to placebo. And the primary endpoint of TOPCAT was cardiovascular death, aborted cardiac arrest, or heart failure hospitalization. And you'll remember that when you looked at that composite endpoint, there was no difference in outcomes between the two treatment arms of the trial. But you'll also probably remember that we made a real effort to enroll patients from Eastern Europe. And when we broke the data out, and compared how the patients did in Russia and the country of Georgia compared to the Americas, you can see on the right side of this slide that the mortality rate in Eastern Europe was much lower and the drug didn't appear to have any impact. Whereas if the patients were enrolled in the Americas, the mortality rate was much more what we would expect in this patient population and the drug seemed to have an effect. I think this has raised a lot of questions about whether the patients that were enrolled in Eastern Europe actually had HEFPEF. And if they didn't have it, it was unlikely that the drug was going to work. So I think if you're seeing patients that, that look like the patients who were enrolled in, in TopCat in the Americas, it's likely that spironolactone has some advantage in that population. And then, as you know, this data was presented at ESC just um, last month. The Emperor Preserved trial, which was a HEF-PEF trial, in patients with symptomatic heart failure, EFs of greater than 40% and an elevated NT pro BNP, um, and they were randomized to either empagliflozin, the SGLT2 inhibitor, or placebo, and the primary endpoint was cardiovascular death or heart failure hospitalization. And once again, we can see that the patients who were treated with an SGLT2 inhibitor 
have an important reduction in that primary endpoint compared to patients who were randomized to placebo. And that effect seemed to be persistent at least through three years. And at the bottom of this slide, you can see that the women tended to have even a little better uh, outcome than men uh, with a 25% reduction in that primary endpoint. So I wanna begin to close up my comments by thinking about some of the important knowledge gaps we have for women who have heart failure. We've been able to, to look at some data in my earlier slides that show that women tended to have a lower quality of life, they tended to have more symptoms than men, and they have a, a higher rate of medication adverse events. And we should be thinking about all of those issues as we begin to tailor our approach to women who have heart failure. We need to be thinking more about managing their risk factors and how that may have an, a positive effect long-term on their risks. And be thinking about how differently women respond uh, with regards to remodeling. But I think that we all need to, to make a commitment to enrolling more women in clinical trials and, and begin focusing our attention and weighting our clinical studies so that we can make um, uh, important, more important observations on the impact of some of the drug therapies that we're testing. We need to be com um, compelled to begin studying how to prevent some of the negative impacts of chemotherapy, uh, particularly for breast cancer, on women's heart health. And we need to be thinking about some of the other um, uh, risk factors for conditions that oftentimes affect women like Takasubo. So I'll close this way and just remind you that heart failure in women is characterized by different etiologies, different comorbidities, and a different response to cardiac injury. Women are much more likely to have HEF-PEF than men, and the disease tends to go up in, in incidence, uh, um, and is particularly common uh, in, the, in their 80s and 90s. There's really no compelling evidence that women should be treated with different drugs or doses than uh, the consensus guideline directed medical therapy with the caveats that we talked about a little bit earlier and a real attention to the fact that women tend to be a bit more sensitive to some of these drugs than men. And I think that there are important opportunities that remain to develop a deeper understanding of sex related heart failure biology, phenotypes and responses to therapy. And the latter should actually be required, a required element in clinical trials. I thank you for your attention and I look forward to our panel discussion.